I've been studying some crazy stuff about the bottomless pit. This stuff will make the hair on your arm stand up. I am not joking. It um, looks like a terrible, terrible, unbelievable plague of demons from hell is going to be unleashed on this earth like the world has never seen. It's really hard to believe. Chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, who is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. The locusts that John saw come out of the bottomless pit were a kind of infernal cherubim. That is, they were a combination of horse, the man, the woman, the lion, and the scorpion. And the sound of their wings as flying was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. So we're talking about Nephilim offspring, fallen angel offspring, where they did, it says in the book of, uh, jubilees about them actually corrupting the animals and actually making hybrids where you had genetic hybrids between humans and animals. One thing that people don't really notice about these locusts mentioned in Revelation is that they can't they don't touch any green thing they don't touch grass trees or any green thing which obviously if they were regular locusts they would be eating those things. So we're not talking normal locusts here okay. The character of the torment was like that of a sting of a scorpion which causes excruciating pain that often causes the afflicted person to desire to die. So fearfully excruciating will be the anguish of those who shall be tormented by these scorpion locusts, that they will seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, but death shall flee from them. The inference being that these locusts or demon controlling them have power to prevent death. So when we're talking people who are possessed that want to die and they can't because the demon's controlling them and, and tormenting them. And of course, these are the, the really bad demons. Imagine you were in these end times and you were seeing this firsthand. You were seeing these people being tormented by these scorpions. And these scorpions happen to be the disembodied spirits of fallen cherubim angels who did some sort of genetic modification with animals. Yeah, that's why they're a little weird looking. We're talking craziness here. We're talking very weird. So it may look something like this here. You have people who are possessed that are acting like rabid animals. And actually, we're going to get into it a lot more in a little while here with as we progress. I'm going to actually show you how all this stuff connects. And actually, the things that sound crazy that you see in horror flicks today actually might not be so crazy when the end times come upon us. When this bottomless pit is opened, all those horror movies are going to come to life. 
some of the stuff I'm studying here is fitting together way too consistently. I've been looking into the Great Pyramid again. Whenever I look into this topic, I find all manner of really interesting information. And then I started looking also into the bottomless pit because there's an area underneath the Great Pyramid called the bottomless pit. I did a video about how I believe that the bottomless pit is under the Great Pyramid and there's literally an area called the bottomless pit under the Great Pyramid. I believe the Great Pyramid is actually a pillar unto the Lord. We see this in Isaiah 19:19. 19, 19. I started fitting this together piece by piece and I, I found others within this movement that have come to the same conclusion. Even uh, Rob Skiba talks about this a lot with the Great Pyramid. And actually I came to this conclusion before I saw his videos and I saw his videos and I'm like, man, he's saying the exact same thing I was thinking. Uh, in that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord now this is this type of speech here you see in Isaiah 19 19 is kind of like what you see in Proverbs where it says the same thing twice but usually something's changed a little bit this is a very common uh, poetic factor uh, with prophecy and, and with uh, just Proverbs of wisdom in the Bible it says that there's an altar to the Lord and then it says there's a pillar unto the Lord. And it says the altar is in the middle of the land of Egypt. And the pillar is at the border of the land of Egypt. There is only one site that actually fits this criteria. And that site is the Great Pyramid, which sits between lower and upper Egypt on the border, but is also in the midst, in the middle of Egypt. While its location is startling enough, that is only the beginning of the wonders of this remarkable structure. It stands 42 stories high and covers an area the size of 10 football fields. It is an almost solid mass of limestone weighing in excess of 14 billion pounds. Yet in 5,000 years, the Great Pyramid situated on what appears to be a pile of sand has settled less than one half inch. Originally, its radiant structure with its massive covering of highly polished limestone blocks were fitted to tolerances of one two thousandth of an inch, so precise that a razor blade could not be inserted between the joints. It was optical precision on a scale of acres, and the Great Pyramid is still the most perfectly aligned structure on Earth, missing true north by only three arc minutes. And in spite of its massive size, it is only out of straight alignment on all four sides by approximately one quarter of an inch. But the Great Pyramid is not only a structural wonder, it is a mathematical wonder as well. The esteemed architect Clarence Larkin came up with the following facts. Taking the Hebrew cubit at 25.025 inches, the length of each side of the Great Pyramid is 365.2422 cubits, which just happens to be the exact length of the solar year. What's more, the solution to the mathematical problem of how to square the circle is incorporated within the geometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. For centuries, the Great Pyramid was the tallest building in the world, and it contains enough stone to build a six-foot wall from New York to Los Angeles. There's even more to this amazing building, but for now, let's see if we can determine what the Great Pyramid has to do with Scripture and with end times. There is an obscure verse in the book of Isaiah, which has baffled commentators for many years. Speaking of the last days, Isaiah says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the middle of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. So this verse is saying that the altar and pillar is both in the border and in the middle of Egypt at the same time. But how can this be? Interestingly, there is only one spot that fits the description of being in the middle of Egypt and at the border at the same time. And that is where the Great Pyramid of Giza now stands. The reference would seem to place the altar and the monument in different places, on the border and in the middle of the land. So how do we come to the conclusion that the Great Pyramid is the fulfilment of that prophecy? 
As it turns out, the Great Pyramid of Giza is the only monument that fits this qualification of being in the middle of the land of Egypt and at its border at the same time, but only if we have an understanding of ancient geography. The Great Pyramid, as we can see, lies at the apex of the triangle created by the Nile Delta. But in ancient times, Egypt was divided into two countries, Lower Egypt, or the Delta, and Upper Egypt. The Great Pyramid sits precisely on this border. Yet this is also the centre of the land of Egypt, when the two ancient countries are viewed as one. Isaiah's enigmatic prophecy regarding an altar and a pillar refers specifically to the end times. Its location is fixed, and since the billions of pounds of limestone that makes up the Great Pyramid are not likely to be moved anytime soon, we are left with the conclusion that the Great Pyramid of Giza just might possibly be the altar and pillar Isaiah was referring to. But why? Who would build it for such a purpose? Archaeologists, geologists, mathematicians and scientists of all kinds have probed and measured and studied the Great Pyramid in great detail, but they have yet to come up with a simple answer as to what is its purpose. Even though Egyptologists maintain that the Great Pyramid was nothing more than a burial tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu, the fact of the matter is, no mummy, no body of any kind has ever been found in any pyramid. The so-called sarcophagus that was found in the King's Chamber, for instance. There's no lid for the sarcophagus and there's no way of getting one into the king's chamber or out again. So there is no possible way this could have been used as a burial tomb. The sarcophagus is, however, a perfect representation of a golden rectangle, a mathematical theorem not discovered until thousands of years after the pyramid was built. And the grand gallery leading up to the king's chamber does show evidence of being an ancient observatory, focusing on a particular part of the heavens. And once again, the construction of this massive gallery is accomplished with computer precision. In addition, there are four star shafts, two in the north face and two in the south, each pointing to four specific stars, Orion, Sirius, Beta Ursa Minor and Draco. But why? What would a dead king want with portals to the stars? Ancient Egypt preserved complex beliefs concerning the creation of the world in the little-known Edfu building texts carved into the walls of the Edfu temple in Upper Egypt. These hieroglyphics speak of the Builder Gods, who set out the plans and foundations for all the future pyramids and temples. I think we should take another, more literal look at these hieroglyphics. Certainly they portray giants who are clearly in charge of whatever activity is going on. Could it be that these giants are none other than the offspring of the Nephilim, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, which were thrust down to earth with Lucifer? The scripture describes them as men of great renown as well as giants. Only they had the knowledge skill and power to create an edifice that would serve as a replica of the heavenly Jerusalem from which they had just been evicted, with its gleaming polished limestone surface and gold capstone. So the Great Pyramid is actually this altar unto the Lord. And of course it's a pyramid shape. And before the flood, the Great Pyramid had limestone casing stones on it. These casing stones are actually uh, more full of moisture than limestone today, so it kind of indicates that it's different in some respect from what standard limestone is in Egypt today. A lot of this limestone was removed, these casing stones from the Great Pyramid, when they started falling apart after a, uh, a massive earthquake, I think it was in th yeah, 1303 AD, and a lot of them were used to build Muslim moss. The interesting thing was before the flood we could not build the Great Pyramid. We have no way to do it with the technology we have today. And we know that way back then they were not able to do this with what we know of their tools. So obviously there was some sort of advanced uh, tools being used. So this Great Pyramid actually was reflecting light with these limestone casing stones and would have been able to be seen from many, many miles away, um, even from space. I would assume that you could see it with the sun reflecting off it. Uh, 
And what I believe actually the Great Pyramid was made in the image of is New Jerusalem. If you look at uh, Revelation 21, it talks about New Jerusalem, and a lot of people assume it's a cube shape, but actually I don't think it is. It doesn't say it's a cube shape. It just tells you the length, width, and height are equal. And I, I've looked into some articles on this topic, and actually it just came to my head. I just started getting these impressions that people were wrong about New Jerusalem, and I just kind of to get, maybe maybe it's from God, I'm kind of getting this feeling of this thought that it's, they're wrong about what New Jerusalem is. It's actually a pyramid shape. And I look and I see that uh, there's others saying the same thing. It's like, wow, this is amazing. So uh, I looked into it more and, you know, it says 1,500 miles for New Jerusalem, uh, you know, length, width, height. But actually, this is sort of an assumption of, of how it's actually being measured. In reality, I think what is being described in Revelation 21 is that it's 1,500 mile circumference, uh, the four sides. So you have the length length and width being actually 375 miles by 375 miles and the height being 375 miles, being in a pyramid shape similar to what the Great Pyramid was when it, when it was originally made. And I believe that, you know, based on some of the studies I'm doing here, and like I said, I'm not going into great detail on this. I'm just explaining out what kind of some of the conclusions I've made from my study so far, I believe Enoch actually was commissioned over building the Great Pyramid, and perhaps we, you know, it's not something that we know for sure. Uh, perhaps even the Nephilim were used to create the Great Pyramid because we know that Enoch was the one who is speaking to God about their problem, these fallen angels that really screwed up, and we know also that with King Solomon's temple, they actually use the Amorites and the Hittites, other various Nephilim offspring to build it, which the Israelites were supposed to have destroyed these fallen angel offspring, but instead they used them as forced labor to build the temple. So why wouldn't it be possible that, you know, they were being used for forced labor, these fallen angels, to build this altar unto God? you know, in a sense, sort of like a punishment for their sins and their crimes against God, you know, with the, the coming down on Mount Hermon, according to the book of Enoch, these 200 fallen angels. And this is just a guess. We don't know exactly, right? So this is just some of the stuff I've been learning from my, my, my research into this topic. And I realized, you know, that this great pyramid as an altar is an image of New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is also a pyramid shape, and it shines with the glory of God, according to Revelation 21, and it replaces the sun and the moon in the new in new earth, new heaven, new earth, New Jerusalem uh, setup. So what I'm thinking is that, uh, you know, with the Great Pyramid, it was actually created before the deluge, before the Great Flood, and there's also indication that of flood waters various water damage in on the Great Pyramid. And with this being said, you know, that kind of lends credence to the fact that it was actually built before the Great Flood. Now with these fallen angels being judged, they were actually judged 700 years before the Great Flood. Because what we see with the Great Flood is actually the offspring of the fallen angels that are causing trouble and corrupting the earth. And that the fallen angels had already been judged 700 years before the Great Flood and were already put in Tartarus. Now, I tend to believe that Tartarus and the bottomless pit are one and the same. I'm not totally sure. Some say that the bottomless pit is separate, the bottomless pit's for the demons only, and that the and Tartarus is separate and the lowest far, part of hell, uh, I guess you would say, and that's where the fallen angels are in chains, according to, what is it, Second Peter? Let me look. Uh, actually, it's uh, 2 Peter 2, four and Jude 1.6, because Jude 1.6 and 2 Peter 2, uh, 2 Peter and Jude follow the same basic uh, storyline. And Jude quotes from the book of Enoch and also mentions that they're bound in chains, which is not, you don't find that type of terminology or phraseology anywhere in the Old Testament. You only find that in the book of Enoch. So this is even more lending credence to the book of Enoch. Look at the book of Enoch, chapter 10, 
it talks about the archangel Raphael imprisoning the fallen angel Azazel. It says, The Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is an dudale, God's cattle crucible cauldron, and cast him, him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks. Cover him with darkness. Let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth. Okay, so you can see kind of that it says something about uh, the location right here, Dudale, right? And actually, if we look at the book of Tobit, it actually tells us where this is located. Tobit 8, verses 1 through 3. And after they had supped, they brought in the young man to her. And Tobias, remembering the angel's word, took out of his bag part of the liver and laid it upon the burning coals. Then the angel Raphael took the devil and bound him in the desert of Upper Egypt. This is kind of interesting. Okay, so we have an angel being bound by Raphael, not the same angel, but a different angel, a different fallen angel, a devil. And so he likely bound him in the same place or very close by. Now some say that the fallen angels were actually put into a different location and that Tartarus is actually farther down than the bottomless pit even, and that Tartarus is where the fallen angels were put and the bottomless pit is where the demons were put. Okay, and this might be the case, or maybe they were put in the same place. Both of them are in Egypt, from what I can tell. Now, it might be that the fallen angels themselves were put, uh, this is speculative, this is what one person says here, that it might have they might have been placed in Nabta Playa complex, which is uh, a circular megalithic structure. <clears throat> And that it's rough, it has rough and jagged rocks, as like the Book of Enoch says. Here is the image of that location. Now, that may be where, underneath this, where this Azazel was buried, deep down in the in the ground, and it's in Upper Egypt. Or it could be also underneath the bottomless pit. You know, I don't know how how this this jagged, rough and jagged rocks was translated. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, so, you know, either way, it looks like both uh, the bottomless pit and uh, Tartarus, whether they're one and the same or not, are both located in Egypt. Uh, so it's it's pretty interesting topic. The way they're explaining some of this with the bottomless pit is pretty disturbing about these disembodied spirits. Okay, it talks about... Let me just read a little bit of this, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. Demons, who are not Satan's angels, but a class of disembodied spirits, supposed by many to be the disembodied spirits of the inhabitants of the pre-Adamite earth, which is what it is that we're talking Nephilim offsprings, disembodied spirits, or demons, who, as they have liberty and opportunity as in the days of Christ, try to re-embody themselves again in human bodies. And this is what some people talk about, is what they're going to try to do. And this is actually what's going to happen. This is what it's talking about with scorpion stings. When it, when it talks about the bottomless pit being open in Revelation, I'll read and you'll, talk, you'll know what I'm talking about. They are wicked, unclean, vicious spirits. And actually, according to the book of Jubilees, 90% uh, of them were put into the bottomless pit. Only 10% of demons are on the earth right now. 10%. And these are like the, the nice ones. The ones that are on earth right now are like the not mean ones. The ones that weren't trying to kill people, somehow kill people as spirits, you know. They were complaining about the fact that these disembodied spirits were killing people and causing a lot of havoc. And they asked God to remove them from the earth. All these corrupted beings that were killed off in the flood. Because they were causing havoc even after they were dead. Okay, so they were asking God to remove them. So God said, okay, I'll remove 90% of them. I'll leave 10%. I'll leave the ones that are not so bad on earth. So what you see today as demons are actually like the not bad ones. Okay. When revelation 
when we have the bottomless pit opened up, we have the other 90% released back onto Earth. This is what we're talking about here, okay? Uh, they are wicked, unclean, vicious, have the power to derange both mind and body. Matthew 12, 22, 15, 22, Luke 4, 35, 8, 26 through 36, 9, 42. I wanted to also mention that a lot of occultists go to the Great Pyramid to receive revelation. I think they're actually somehow communicating with these spirits that are underneath the Great Pyramid. I think that the bottomless pit's under the Great Pyramid. And this is why maybe why you see Aleister Crowley went to the Great Pyramid and he had saw a gray. Before we even knew about UFOs and aliens, he saw a gray in the Great Pyramid. Okay, so that should be a little bit disturbing. I've heard of a lot of other really weird stories about people who've met, went to the Great Pyramid and saw really strange things while they were there. Can you imagine everybody being possessed that's not a Christian and just like being tormented by these demons? And controlled by them, and it started making. I started thinking about these late, latest zombie movies where you have these zombies that are like insane, insanely strong and fast, and just like kind of like locusts, like crime climbing over each other trying to do stuff. And I was like thinking, what if that's related somehow? You know, what if what if this is sort of the devil trying to speak through movies? And then right after I thought about this, I actually found an article. I was actually, I already had the article open, but I was just reading down through it, kind of skimming it. And I saw something that actually related to this, like from ancient times, from uh, Dionysus, uh, the prince of the underworld. It, it's really weird. It has to do with a certain type of magic and uh, possessing spirits or controlling spirits of man using this certain type of magic and it has to, it, it all came from the great pyramids uh when i say the great pyramid the great pyramid was actually set forth to also uh retain knowledge of man while the flood was going on so we had all this knowledge of man being put into the great pyramid to be retained sort of like a library during the flood but of course you know the devil knows how to use such things for perversion information can be used to do evil and i think this is what we're talking about here this is this is why the egypt had the greatest music uh magicians they had the greatest magicians around the time of moses because they all were using this knowledge in an evil way see the whole idea with this diensis is that she can control the spirit of these people through a magic spell she has control of their spirit and they can't resist her and this is why they go and do these mad, crazy things, which means they're basically possessed and they go do crazy stuff, which seems very zombie-like how they're doing it. Uh, the tearing apart and eating alive of sacrificial victim refers to the earliest history of Dionysus. Violent cult rituals existing since the dawn of paganism stipulated that by eating alive or drinking the blood of an enemy of, or an animal, a person might capture the essence of the soul strength of the victim. The earliest Norwegian huntsmen believed this idea. They drank the blood of bears in effort to capture their physical strength. East African Maasai warriors also practiced omophagia, and they sought to gain strength of the wild by drinking blood of lions. Human victims were treated in this way by headhunters of East Indies in effort to capture their essence. And you hear about Satanists that also do this stuff. Through prophet Ezekiel described the magic bands uh, called Kessa Tot of the Becky, which, as in the Amophagia, were used to capture magically imprisoned the souls of men. We read, Therefore, thus says the Lord of God, Behold, I am against your magic bands, Kessa Tut, by which you hunt lives, souls. They are there as birds, and I will tear them off your arms. I will let them go, even those lives, souls, whom you hunt as birds. And this is Ezekiel 13, verse 20. In Acts 17, 34, we read of a man who may have been similarly liberated from the control of Dionysus. Howbeit certain men clave unto Paul and believed, among which was Dionysus the Areopagite. Pegite, sorry. Areopagite. To carry the name Dionysus meant 
one of two things. The parents were devotees of Dionysus and thus called their child was predestined to be a follower of the god or the individual was under the spell of Kesatot, which is what was read basically in Ezekiel there and how God would release him from this possession. The Kesatot was a magic armband used in connection with Orca or a container called the Kisti. Wherever the Kisti is inscribed on sarcophagi and on Bekic scenes, it is depicted as a sacred vessel, a soul prison with a snake peering, snake peering through the open lid. How the magic worked and the way the soul was imprisoned is still a mystery. Pan, the half-human, half-goat god, later relegated to deviledom, is sometimes pictured as kicking the lid open and letting the snake or souls out. Such loose snakes were then depicted as being enslaved around the limbs, bound in the hair of backy women. Such imagery of Pan and the serpent's the imprisoned souls and magic Kesatut and Kisti have never been adequately explained by available authorities and the interpretation of them as method for producing zombies is thus a subject of ongoing scrutiny. Yet since the prophet Ezekiel spoke of the efforts of Baki to mystically imprison souls of men through magic bands of Dionysus, and since Pan was most beloved of Dionysus because of his pandemonium, all the devils, which struck sudden panic in the hearts of men and beasts, and the serpent was universally accepted by the Hebrews as a symbol of occult devotion, it can be easily surmised that the iconography, iconography of Dionysus represented tenacious effort on the part of Baki to employ symbolic and image, Im, imitative magic based on the deeply held ancient beliefs of Orcas. So you get the idea. So what I'm trying to say is, this ancient practice, these mystery religion practice, which is clearly linked to the devil, was a way of possessing people and they became maniacal and even tore and ate people, which reminds me of these zombie movies. And these. And why do we have so much zombie shows? Could this be basically the devil secretly trying to bring this back in? Because this is the devil's way. When he possesses... When this Dionysus, which is akin to the devil, possesses and controls these souls, they become like zombies and eat people. Literally. I mean, in, in a sense, they aren't zombies, but they're, they're going around and eating and ravaging and killing people. Okay? And could it be... I'm just thinking out loud. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, when this bottomless pit is opened and these demons come forth and possess all these people that don't have God... Could it be, in a sense, kind of like zombies? I don't know. It's just really weird to think about. I mean, I, I always used to laugh at this zombie connection with the end times. You know, oh, zombies, okay, ah, yeah, that's funny. But when I started looking into some of these ancient practices and how it's directly linked to the devil, and they were like zombies, and then we have all, clearly that these scorpions are spirits of demons, and they come forth and they possess these people, it could be something kind of really like a horror movie like this. Uh, it's, it's pretty insane to think about. It, it's just crazy to think about. I just thought I would just present this and see what everybody thought. I was just like, wow, this is crazy. 